Good morning, everybody. How you guys are all? Can I have your microphone, Jess? Set in that? All right. Surrendered part two. Anybody remember anything from last week? You're like, oh, we're not. We didn't come last week. Anybody want to be put on the spot? No? Has God, God been good to you? Yes? How good? Very good. Do you want to share an example, Nisi? No? Anybody who, have an, who has an example to share on God's goodness, his mercy? I think each one of us has a testimony. We just walked into a building and we're alive. Somebody say amen. amen. We could have been dead, right? It's a little morbid to think about it or speak about it, but we could have been taken out on our way to church. But God decided that it's not going to happen. He's got his angels protecting you, right? Uh, just a reminder, just look at your neighbor. If you got somebody on your side, just say, Easter, Easter. is on Sunday, Sunday. March 30th. Somebody tell Ernie because he doesn't have anybody sitting next to him. March sorry, March 31st. 31st, sorry about that. March 31st, March 31st. at 11 o'clock. There's going to be some good food. food. We've got some. No, there is, there is. There's going to be good food. And I'm going to bring a friend. And he's going to bring a friend or she's going to bring a friend. Yeah, you can't vouch for them, huh? But how about this? I'm going to bring two friends. Yeah? Can we do that? The food's going to be good. So it's worth the effort to come in and just to understand what God has done for us. I'm calling the sermon paid. Somebody say paid. paid. What happens when you go eat at a restaurant and you've cleared the bill? They put a little stamp on it that says paid. So I'm going to be speaking about how God has paid for us to take us back to where we belong with him, right? Redemption. Wow, God is good, man. Thankful to be alive. Thankful to have my brain all working fine. I can see, can cast vision, speak into people's lives. I just had somebody call last week. And uh, as a member of the church, he said, Pastor, I'm in a position, a unique position, and I'm trying to figure out what God wants me to do. I don't like the job I'm in. Um, and I'm not really sure about what to do. There's some other opportunities. So I spoke to them about the growth track. I said, have you done that? That gives you a little bit of a, uh, an insight into how you're made, um, how you're designed. You can start working towards some of those things. Because a job that leads to no satisfaction, um, no empowerment towards getting to a, a higher place isn't worth it. And that's how the world lives, right? At least find a job that's going to pay you well, that you enjoy doing, right? Now, we believers have a different way of living. We believe in a purpose God has for our lives. Somebody say amen. Because some of you might not be believing that. 
We all are made for a certain thing. A certain design has been embedded into our body. And the sooner we align ourselves into how we're made, it's almost like taking a, anybody see a star screwdriver? Yeah? It's like trying to screw a, a flat screw with a star screw. It just doesn't work. And you, you end up struggling, trying to make it fit in, and you're not fitting in because you're made different. You're made for a different purpose. And the, the sooner you identify how and what you're made for, we're all made to glorify him. The sooner we identify how we're going to be glorifying him, the easier lives are going to be. And even the financial end that we look at, right? Hey, we want to be able to monetize some of the gifts that God has given us so I can have food to eat. Right? You guys aren't saying amen. amen. You want food to eat, right? Amen. Yes, we all do. We want to make sure that the work that we put our efforts towards produces results so that we can have something to eat. In the same manner, so this, th these positions or these uh, career decisions, I challenge you all, young people, to take those matters to God. To say, God, what is it that I am made for? And I will, you know, I'll also clear up some myths. We as human beings, everybody raise your hand. Every single person. We're all, repeat after me, I am, I am. called... To his, to his ministry. Okay, you can put your hands down now. Go back to the lesson. We're all called to his ministry. Now, if you're doing it in a pastoral role or in a vocational role, is depending on that specific calling that you have. Right? I'll give you an example. There are pastors who do this uh, job as a pastoral role full time. Right? And then there are people like me. And I call it overtime, because <laughs> everything I do has to add value to God's kingdom. Has to. I don't do it for, I don't have my businesses for the pure sake of just making money. Right? And there, it's, it's like everybody uses a bank. You guys put money into a bank. You don't put money into a bank because you think, OK, it's doing some good. You put money into your bank because you want the returns it gives you, right? And contrary to that, when I do something, it has to bless somebody else. It has to grow. Somebody say grow. grow. We forget that aspect. We want to be able to bless somebody. We want to be able to uplift somebody. We want to be able to help them grow. And these kind of things you can do, and when, when, when God has given you gifts that you nurture, that you develop, that you take some steps towards, you, you'll be able to be blessed. And then when you're blessed, you'll be able to be a blessing. Right? It's one thing to go feed somebody for a day. Now, if you empower somebody to go do the same thing that you're doing, which is knowing how to be fed, knowing how to do some work, and then going on to bless others, you would have just multiplied yourself. And I encourage all you young people to start doing that. Start thinking with God in your mind. What does God want me to do? What does he want me to pursue? What are the talents that he has given me? Right? You might hear me sing, but I, I can, my wife can very clearly tell you, I am not made to be a singer. Right? Somebody say Amen. Yeah, very loudly, huh? <laughs> but I'll tell you this. I am made to empower people. Somebody say amen. amen. You say amen when I talk about singing. <laughs> I'm made to empower people, right? I'm made to create things, right? Can, can you guys raise your hand to, to show me if you guys are creators? Anybody, any creators here who like to do creative things? Just be confident, Yeah. And all those that didn't raise their hand, can you raise your hand now? Because I want to I wanna speak some life into it. Can you raise your hand? Yeah, those who haven't raised your hand, raise your hand now. You are all creative. 
All right, you just haven't realized what that, what that gift is. And I encourage you, please, if you are free on Fridays, come to my small group. I'll have a discussion with you. I'll help you understand what that means. And you might really like accounting, all right? Accounting doesn't seem like a creative role. But there's another part to accounting that's its sister or brother called finance, right? Finance is a very creative role, still working with money, still working with numbers. And you can get creative there. You can do things that multiply things. So you might think you're not creative. You might be, you might have, you know, and we as human beings make that mistake. We tell people, Hey, you're not the creative type. Because usually when we think about creativity, we think about a musician, we think about an artist. What else? A filmmaker, right? So some of the arts. But tr truth be told, if you don't have creativity, if you don't have the arts, you don't have all the sciences that we take for, for granted today. Right? There is, if you think about Einstein, he said, imagination is more powerful than... Knowledge. Imagination is more powerful than knowledge. Right? Science just tells you what something is, or maybe how something um, got to its place. But what science will never tell you is why. That's why they're still trying to figure out. <laughs> yeah, I still don't believe it. You're like, oh, the science says at least, you know, billions of years ago. The world came in existence because it was a big bang. I don't know about you, but there's an intelligent design the moment you start looking at anything. You look at a human being, you'll see a DNA of their parents. If you look at a, an animal, a lion, a tiger, you'll see some design there. It's not by accident that a lion just pops up. I'll also tell you this. The very dirt that we think is dead has something in it that births new life. Throw a seed into the ground. What happens? A plant is born. So think about that. Every one of you is born to be creative. Each one of you. All of those that like, eh, my teacher at school didn't tell me I was creative because I couldn't sketch something well. Right? If that was the case, I'd be failing that creative aspect every single day. We all are. We all are made in whose image? God's image. And he created for how many days? Six days. And he rested? That's what we're called to do. We're supposed to be creating. All right, let's get back to surrendered. Here's a quote that will bless you. To surrender to God is to give up all pushback. We spoke about pushback, right? To give up all pushback against his rule. Somebody say his rule. His rule. Repeat after me. His way. His, way. his, plan. his plan. His process. His process. And his timing. Timing is so important. I found out the wrong way. I found out, I mean, it's, it's fine when you say the wrong way. But I found out the hard way that timing is important. There's a grace that you have when God releases something to you versus when you try to go grab it. We'll do a series on my friend Jacob that was renamed Israel. He was trying to grab for things. But the moment he let God give it to him, his life was easy. His burdens were light. So last week we spoke about why do we surrender, right? Let's recap the four reasons we should surrender to God from last week. That's what I was going to test you guys. The first one was, anybody remember? He made you. Somebody say, I have a creator. And we need to walk like we have a creator. We, we walk around aimlessly in life wondering who made us and why he made us. Let's get back to the source. 
Second one is he knows you. He knows you intimately, right? The third one is he loves you. Somebody say, Jesus loves me. And the fourth one is he's pursuing you. He's pursuing you. You know what that means? Let me give you a context. I was living my life in America, and this woman shows up, Pastor Jess, right? I was pursuing her. I left my country, went over there. I lied to her, by the way, just to get an appointment. Just being honest here. She said, why are you coming? What's a man got to do? I said, I'm coming to see the queen. <laughs> it's not my fault she was stupid enough to think it was the queen of England. I was coming to see my queen, right? And they say the rest is history because I'll get into trouble if I keep going. Pursue. God is pursuing you just like your pastor was his wife. Pursue. Chase after you. Sometimes we get a little uncomfortable with it, right? Like, I don't know what's wrong with this fellow. He keeps calling me. The girls are like, eh, I know some of these. But I want you to pick up that phone call from God, though. Ladies, men, he's pursuing you. Pick up that call. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Set aside your self-righteous pride, so that he may exalt you, to a place of honor in his service, to a place of honor in his service at the appropriate time. We're talking about his timing again. So important. We have to understand that his hand is mighty. Anybody ever remembered when you read the Bible, I think this microphone, the battery is dying, Moses. Keeps cutting out. When, when the Bible says, fear God, what is he talking about? Be afraid? He loves you. He sent his son to die on the cross for you. That should give you an idea of what it means to fear God. Yes, he is a, he is a God that created the heavens and the earth. I believe that word means that he would, you fear that he would remove his hand over you. That his covering would be removed. That his protection would be removed. That his blessing would be removed. Can I tell you this? You can work hard all you want. All you want. Think you're successful. But if God just turns off the sun, everybody's going to be in darkness. There's no groceries we get to buy because plants aren't going to be coming up. There's no jobs we're going to have. We need our God who has made the heaven and the earth to bless us, right? His hand is mighty. It is so mighty that eventually, what does the Bible say? Every knee shall bow. I'm looking forward to me dying. Maybe not my family so much, but... I love my God so much that I'm looking forward to the day where I get to go from here with all you people. You guys are all fun. You guys are all lovely. I know you love me. But you guys are not anywhere close to what I'm going to be enjoying once I get to heaven. Can I have the mic? That's what I'm... Check. Hello, 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 hello. Can you hear me? No, no. Check. All right. Give me the other mic again. Sorry about that. Those of you that are watching online, we're having some technical difficulties. And we should be fine. No? Yes, yes. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The mighty hand of God isn't a fist shaking against us. 
Check. Yeah. Somebody's going to have to change some batteries. Even this one's not working. Yes? No? And you start preaching and there's a microphone is just turning off. All right, where was I? Somebody remind me. Jesus, huh? Mighty hand of God. Yeah, he's not a fish shaking at us, right? You know, my wife knows I'm not going to punch her, but if I do this, she's still going to be mad. She's going to be fearful, not mad. She's going to be afraid. Our God, who loves us so much, isn't a God that is going to be doing that. You know, we can mess up so many times. I spoke about Jonah the other day, right? It was grace that had that fish swallow him up. That he was able to get out onto the sand and not drown in the water. It wasn't God's fist. It was his grace. It was his hand that he extended that he was able to hold on to. The mighty hand of God is open. What else does it have? Nail. He's got some scars, right? Nail scars. And extending from arms so great that they stretched wide enough to forgive every single sin and save the whole world. He stretched out for you and me so wide. I mean, those are some strong arms. That's a strong chest, right? We Indians, we speak about Modi's 56-inch chest. It's like this man's carrying the country. Our God is carrying everything else. The whole world, the whole universe. You and me. To forgive every sin and save the whole world. And you know, some people who are getting close to dying, they still feel for the lack of their knowledge and understanding that God still doesn't like them. They get it wrong somewhere, and they feel that despite all that they do, God is their enemy, right? But despite those things, those thoughts, God is still trying to chase you. He's still trying to win your heart. On Judgment Day, we all will bow, bow down. Have you ever heard a sound so great that there is fear, right? Sometimes you hear a big blast, a, 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 definitely not on Diwali because everybody's just cracking it up, but in an unknown situation, you hear a firecracker go off that's so loud you can feel it, not just hear it. Now imagine that times a billion or whatever it is, when just the earth shakes with the earthquake, you can feel that tremor. Now imagine a God who's created all of that. For him, the earth is tiny. The magnitude of who he is will get us on our knees in that fear. But those of us who submit to Jesus willingly, despite our many flaws and failings, we don't bow down in fear. We don't. We don't bow down in fear. We do surrender in trust. We surrender in trust. I shared that little comedy sketch about my life in Huntington Beach when the police pulled out some guns. Truth be told, I didn't, I didn't trust those police 100%, right? They're human beings. They can do silly things as we've seen. Fire, accidentally kill somebody. But we can know for sure that we can trust our God and surrender to his will because of what he has done, because of what he says he will do. 
So this week, I want to speak about how to surrender. Somebody say, how to surrender. How to surrender. Surrender, the word is defined to mean to submit, to submit out of your own will, to succumb to when it's beyond your will. And for example, you're fighting in a war, right? And your, your teams are taken out. You surrender because you can't really do much. Another way to define that is to seize resistance. That means you're no longer fighting. You're starting to wave the white flag saying, I'm, I'm, I'm done, buddy. Right? That's the form that I want us to focus on, to seize resistance. The dictionary also defines surrender as a yield to the power, control, or possession of another. To yield to the power, control, or possession of another. That's what the, di the dictionary defines it as. Sometimes it can feel scary. Like how I felt when the police officer pulled me over. It can feel scary. You don't know what's going to happen. Right? <laughs> it can also feel very scary when you hand over the driving wheel to your wife. Right? And she has, in her best attempts, tried to learn how to drive. But sitting next to her while she's learning is not my strengths. Right? I need somebody else who's made stronger to sit next to her while she figures out the system of driving in India. Imagine going under, right? Anybody been through a surgery? I've had so many accident, my, accidents in my life. I've had so many surgeries in my life. One of the things that the, I had a shoulder surgery done uh, in America right before we left, right after Bella was born. And I remember having to, right before they operate, they come out with a piece of paper. Like you, you don't really have a choice at that point. You sit down and they say, uh, we need you to sign here. And we say, well, what's this for? It says, in case you die <laughs> while you're under, we're not responsible. At that point, you're like, you might as well. You've thought about it. You made that decision. Sign your life away, saying, doctors, I trust you. I surrender to your knowledge and to your experience, right? And sometimes surrender is particularly difficult if you test positive for, not the coronavirus, the control of virus. Somebody say amen. amen. Some of you have that control of virus. You like to control everything. You like things to be in your way. If it's not in your way, that you, it just messes your day up. Can I tell you, you got to be vaccinated against that to be in God's will? Can't have that virus and, and, and be successful in God. Can't have that virus and walk with God. Can't have that virus and follow where he wants you to go. Mark chapter 10, verse 15. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Anyone who does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. You can't have Christ and control. You can't have Christ and control. Do you know why little children don't, don't struggle with control? You see those ads with children strapped into their car seats, right? If you've ever done that yourself, I know not too many parents here, but after about five, 10 minutes, if they struggle initially, they're set. They figured out, mommy and daddy have locked me in. I do not have the power to come out on my own. Right? While dad and mom are sitting there arguing about which direction to take. Uh -huh. 
And the kids, they do that until they're taught to fear by bad experience. Right? They learn from their experiences. Little children are completely, completely trusting. Which is why Jesus said, come like a little child. For the kingdom of heaven is yours. That's what God's saying. Completely trust me with that kind of an innocence. Don't say, well, let me think about it. Kids don't think about it. When mommy and daddy say, son, hold my hand. It's not safe out there. They don't question it. They say they know better. Right? At their level, they, they can't really see as far as we can. And in the same manner, our God can see your future much more clearly than you can. And he's saying, trust me. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 to 7. Trust in and rely confidently on the Lord with, with what? Some of your heart? Does it say with your mind? With all your heart and do not rely on your own insight and understanding. But God, this is what I see. And he's saying don't rely on that. You're looking at it from your view. Think about that picture of a child and a parent. The child is tiny. All he can see is at his level. Don't trust what you can see. Trust in whose hand you're holding. They can see where you need to go. They can see further than you. They can see beyond your fears. In all ways, know and acknowledge and recognize him. And he will make your path straight and smooth. Removing obstacles that block your way. Do not be wise in your own eyes. I always tell people, be foolish for Jesus. Be what? Foolish for Jesus. There's no heavenly reward for being wise of the world. There is an eternity waiting for those that are foolish for God, though. Fear the Lord with reverent awe and obedience. Obey him. When he says, Josh, do this, it is not a matter of debate. He's not asking, do you want to do this? And if you take it the wrong way, it might be sounding like, hey, you, know, you might even come from the perspective, like, God, I, I've lived my life long enough. I know how I'm made. Can you just trust me this once? Because God is our Father, he can see beyond us. He's saying, no, I want you to trust me. So obey him. Entirely. And turn from evil. From Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 to 7, we can find three important steps for surrendering to God. How many of you want to know how to surrender? It's not easy, right? I'm going to give you three steps. The first one is choosing a side. Sounds like a game, doesn't it? You guys watch cricket, football, basketball? Anybody, any basketball fans? A couple of you. I was watching the Laker game today, and the shot clock had malfunctions, and they wasted 20 minutes. Never happened in all of my years watching the NBA. But you got to pick a side. D 
Do you get anywhere by rooting for both teams that are playing? Huh? No? Anybody root for both teams? Hedging your bets? No, you got to pick a side. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7. It says, fear the Lord with reverent awe and obedience and turn entirely from evil. Don't be holding on to some part saying, I would like a piece of this. Choose a side. To surrender to God means deciding once and for all that you play for whose team? His team. Not the opponent's team. You're playing for God's team. And his team alone, you're not playing for any other team. Right? Only playing for one team. Let me give you an example. Anybody um, want to be in a relationship, want to get engaged? All you single people, raise your hand. Yeah? Single ladies. Come on, be confident. Put that hand up. And men. These are all giggling. You're like, nope, not me. <laughs> yeah, Ernie, I see you, Ernie. The moment a man puts a ring on you, what happens? There's no more game to be played, ladies and gentlemen. The game is officially over. Don't wear a t-shirt saying game over because it might offend your wife one day. <laughs> Speaking from experience. Right? Once the ring goes on, you stop conversating with the other people that you're trying to figure out if they were meant for you. You say, no, we, we don't do that. You play for one team. Which means you say no to the others. You don't go say, well, I'm hedging my bets. If this doesn't work out, let me hit you up. Let me tell you two things from there, right? One, you're not going anywhere with the one you got engaged to, if that's the mindset you have. Two, it's going to suck for you. It doesn't work. You got to pick a side. You got to pick a team. You got to say no to everybody else. You cut off all communication with old flames. Not your parents. James chapter 4, verse 4 to 10. It's getting a little long, so please pay attention. You're cheating on God if all you want is your own way. You're cheating on God if all you want is your own way. And how many of us are like, God, give me this, give me that? We do that, right? We're like, well, the Bible says be like a child, so I'm just going to ask. He does grant the desires of your heart. Not just the wants, not just the needs, the desires. But the Bible says you're cheating on God if all you want is your own way. Flirting with the world every chance you get. You end up enemies of God and his way by flirting with the world. You know what that means? It's you saying, God, I know that you have the best for me, but let me still take that job that, you, that I, I hope will pay me enough. It's just for that little time. Once I'm done with it, I'll come back to you. Try doing that with a girl that you're engaged with. Honey, just hold on for a bit. This girl looks really fine. Game over. It doesn't work. It won't work with a woman and definitely won't work with God because he made her. And do you suppose God doesn't care? The proverb has it that he's a fiercely jealous lover. He's jealous. He wants you for, 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 for all of you, not just some of you. He wants you for all of you. 
He's jealous, man. And what he gives us, gives in his love, is far better than anything else you'll find. It's common knowledge that God goes against the willful proud. God gives grace to the willing humble. So let God do his work, do his will in you. Yell a loud no to the devil. Somebody say no. Say, devil, no. You're a liar. So yell a loud no to the devil and watch him make himself scarce. He's going to run. And at the same time, you say a quiet yes to God, and he's there in no time. Quit dabbing in sin. Purify your inner life. Quit playing the field. Hit bottom and cry your eyes out. You know, we, we were made, we, maybe the surrounding that makes us, we, we, like, I don't ever want to get to a place where I'm desperate. We do that with God, and we need to get desperate with God. The moment our, hit, our knees hit the floor, something happens over there. And he reaches out. Things become clear. Provision starts flowing. Healing starts happening. Engagements happen. She says yes. Get serious. Really serious. Get down on your knees before the master. It's the only way you'll get on your feet. Wow. Get on your knees in order to get on your feet. Isn't that powerful? Quit playing the field and get serious about this relationship. You know, we at Impact, we talk about knowing God, right? We have four ways. Get serious with this relationship that you have. Know God. Quit playing the field. Quit dabbing in sin and purify your inner self. You've got sin that's happening all the time, doing things that you shouldn't be doing. I encourage you to find freedom. Small groups are a place where you can come for help. Growth track is a place where you can come for help as well. Identify what is it that's causing you to sin. Now let God work his will in you. Somebody say his will. Which means that you discover your purpose. God's will. Which means that you're making a difference. Right? That's what we're here for. We're here to know God. We're here to find freedom. We're here to discover our purpose. And what are we going to do with the others? We're like, hey, you know what? I'm going to make a difference in the life of my friend by being there for him, by bringing him into this community that can help him out just like it helped you, by helping him understand that he can lose the baggage of the world. He can remove the yoke that's been put on him. He can remove the, the perceptions or the opinions of others that are weighing him down. So many of us have a hard time removing ourselves from these pressures and pursuing God for what he has called us to do. Pursuing him for the purpose that he has for our lives. The will for our lives. The design that he has made in us. And we start challenging that because we start listening to the wrong crowd. And I always tell people, give us one year. Somebody say one year. I know it's a couple months gone, but give us one year. You join a small group. First go to the, go to the growth track. Join a small group, and I will guarantee you, your life is going to change. Even if you don't want it to change, it's going to get better. You might say, okay, I'm already in a good place. I challenge you. We can teach you how to help see yourself in God. We can teach you how to serve. 
We can teach you how to be a part of a small group. We can teach you to ask more questions about God. We can teach you to find your purpose. We can teach you to continue walking in your purpose. Give us one year. The second one is get to know him. All you young people are like, yeah, I understood the relationship of the engagement. Getting to know him is like dating him. Which means what? You get ready for him. Which means you make time for him. Right? All you ladies, when, when a guy that you like asks you out, what are you going to do? Come out with your nightgown on? No, you're going to look good. You're going to smell fine. You're going to be prepared for his arrival, right? All you single ladies better be saying amen. <laughs> nice and loud from the back. Now, after you're ready, you're going to get to know the brother, right? Yeah. You're going to have to get to know him. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6. In all your ways, know and acknowledge and recognize him. And he will make your path straight and smooth, removing obstacles that block your way. It's going to block your way. Removing the things that are going to make you stumble. What does he do? He removes it. How are you going to know? <laughs> it says right here, get to know him. How do you get to know him? Hmm? Spending time, yeah. Getting intimate. You guys have different thoughts in your mind, but getting intimate with God, it is good. You can't get intimate with somebody with chaos going around. You can't get intimate with noise all around. You can't get intimate with someone with others all around. You can't get intimate with God with sin around. Once we give our lives to Jesus, we obviously need to get to know him. But for those who have been committed to Christ for years, please don't assume that you've already checked this box. Ask a married man. What happens if you ignore your wife? What happens if you don't go out for your, for, to spend time with your wife? You don't get to know them anymore. You got to take your time. Ladies, you got to dress up. You got to look good. A man, mm. <laughs> And man, you got to initiate that, right? And those of you that aren't married, just think about that. Take your plan for that. That's the kind of marriage you should have. And those of you that are married, and if you're not taking your wife out, I'm speaking judgment into your life right now. <laughs> Get to it before she reminds you. Knowing God is not something we do on Sunday morning. Some of us pretend that that's when we go to, to see God. We need to be doing it every day. I challenge you to actually do that at the start of your day. It turns the day around. Surrendering to, to God is a lifetime, oh, sorry, it's a life. Let me do that again. Surrendering to God is a lifelong, progressive journey to know God, to find freedom, to discover purpose, and to make a difference. Surrendering to God is a lifelong, progressive journey. That means you're not standing still. It's going somewhere. Somebody say, I'm going somewhere with my Jesus. I'm going somewhere with my Jesus. Call yourself a follower of Jesus. That means you're not standing anywhere. The words that you tell yourself will remind you that you have to do, there's an action there, right? 
Remind yourself that I've got to move. Jesus is on the move. I've got to hold on. Like any relationship, the better you know him, the more you'll trust him. How are you going to trust a God that you don't know? We don't even trust some of our friends. You can only trust God when you know him. Practical application is when you prioritize spending quality time with God every single day. You know how to make it easy? Schedule it, right? You say, you know what? From this time to this time, I'm not going to allow anything else to take my time. You know, I'm a married man. There's so many demands on my, my, my time. I've got my wife. I've got my kids. But none of this comes before God. Not my wife, not my mom, not my dad. And the best thing to do is just prioritize that time. I like to get up before my whole family does. Do you know why? I can't be intimate with my God when my wife is there, when my kids are there, when things are going on in the kitchen and something falls and it just distracts, right? I can't be intimate. So I like to wake up early and spend time with God. And I encourage you to do that. Find quiet time. If you can buy some of these headphones that they sell that just block out all noise outside. In a country like India, it's really hard to keep all the noise away. Do that. <coughs> Schedule it. Set an alarm. Remove the distractions and start your day fresh. Start your day with your lover. Start your day with Jesus. And say, Jesus, take me. Tell me what to do today. And the last one is pray first. The first one was choose a side. The second one is get to know him. And the third one is pray first. I'm going to read from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, if Sandeep can get on the keys. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Somebody say all again. With all your heart. It's hard for us, right? Sometimes we, life happens. We try to make the best of the time, but the Bible is here to remind us that we're not to do this half-heartedly. We can't play both the teams. We got to choose all of it. Do not depend on your own understanding. This is so important for all of us intelligent, smart people. These decisions have been very calculated. Thank you very much, God. And then he does some thing and makes two fish and five loaves and feeds of 5,000 people. Do the math on that. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do. And he will show you which path to take. Many of you are struggling trying to figure out, what do I do in my life? How do I pursue my purpose? How do I know it's what I'm supposed to do? The Bible says he will show you which path to take. It's clear on what we need to do. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Not even once think that you're as smart as he is. Don't depend on your understanding or your calculations. Then it goes on to say, seek his will in all you do. In everything you do. And he will show you which 
multiple choice question you're supposed to take on for your life. Which one's going to get you to the end? Which one's going to get you to pass the exam of life? Which one's going to put you into a path of success? Which one's going to put you in a job that he wants you to have? Which has all the resources according to his riches? Not yours and not mine. His riches. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. You do not belong to yourself. Somebody say, why? Goes on to say, for God bought you with a high. It wasn't a goat. It wasn't a ram. It was the Lamb of God. It goes on to say, so you must honor God with your body. Some of us believe in everything, but we don't treat our body like the temple. God doesn't reside in buildings. Man-made structures. He's right here. Somebody touch yourself. Say, he's here. He's in me. I'm going to look after me. Because I'm following him. Why don't I get the worship team up here? surrendering to him don't do it kicking and screaming saying I don't want to do this despite the fact that he doesn't want to hurt you he will give you another chance but I'll tell you when you say yes to him from the day one and not day 325, because then you've got nothing else left, right? Your life is going to be full of joy. You would have wasted no time. You would have blessed more people. You would have spoken life into many more situations. You would have been more successful. Can we sing worthy of it all? Do we have that? Why don't we all stand up? Can we get the lights off, please? Let's just sing with our voices. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. For from you are all things. And to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Stop right here. There's some of you that are having a hard time surrendering to His will. You've already said yes to Jesus. If, you, if somebody can turn the lights off in the back, please. You've already said yes to Jesus. You've been saved. 
but you're still having a hard time struggling with releasing yourself from this world. To say yes to him fully. To say, Jesus, I've, I'm not only going to be saved by you, but I'm going to let you be the Lord of my life. And I want to speak to that person. Can we have all eyes closed, all heads bowed during this time? If that's you, it's between you and God right now. This is not a prayer of salvation. This is a prayer of releasing. This is a prayer of surrender. This is a prayer to say, God, you've got me. Thank you for saving my life, but now I'm going to let you lead. If that's you here, you've said yes to Jesus, but you haven't let him lead, just raise your hand up for me to see. Thank you. Thank you. I see you. Thank you. You can put your hands down now. I feel the Holy Spirit telling me that he wants you to get back on track. That he's been trying to pursue you. That he's been knocking on your door trying to to show you which option to take. Which road to walk on. But you've been holding on to the world. He wants me to remind you not to trust in the world, but to put your trust in him. And I'm going to be praying for you. Just join me if that's you. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for these individuals that have acknowledged that they have not been hearing your voice. Father, in their cry to come back and to say, I will follow him. I pray that you would open your voice again and hear their cry. That you'd speak into their lives. Show them the options that they are to take. Help them find their purpose. Help them fulfill your will in their life. Pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. At every service, we give an opportunity for those who haven't said yes to Jesus. A time where you can make a declaration saying, I want him. You might have been chasing things. You might have been chasing the wrong, chasing things that are going to be pleasing in a fleshly sense. Pursuing money rather than the master. Pursuing power rather than the provider himself. And it's because you don't know him intimately. You haven't had a revelation of his love. And if that's you, I want to encourage you to take that step and to say yes to Jesus. You know, the beauty of saying yes to Jesus is that you don't have to fulfill five billion steps to get to him. We're not worthy of it. We understand that. But he is so gracious enough. All he requires from you is to say yes for him to visit you. If that's you today, if there's anybody here that have not intentionally accepted Jesus Christ and it doesn't matter if you were born in a Christian family you don't get to heaven because you're a pastor's kid you've got to make your own decision for yourself if you're ready to open the door to Jesus I have a prayer for you continue closing your eyes and keeping your heads bowed right there in your space if you give me permission to pray over you I'll be counting to three when I do count to three if you give me permission to pray the devil's going to come knocking he's scared that you're going to do what he doesn't want you to do
I want you to say no to the enemy. I want you to say no to the devil. He's going to come with you, come at you with all kinds of tricks, reminding you of your past, reminding you of your sins, reminding you of your struggles. But the beauty in saying yes to Jesus is not only do you have to say no to the enemy, you get to bring your problems to Christ. Bring your baggage and set it at the foot of the cross. And he promises to set you free. So if that's you, when I count to three, be bold and courageous and just shoot your hand up. One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hand down now. Whisper this prayer at your seat. Dear God in heaven, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your precious son, Jesus, to die on the cross for me. I believe he has died for my sins, and I also believe that he is raised from the dead and is alive now. Jesus, come into my heart. Save me and forgive me, and I surrender the rest of my days to you. And now I believe that I am born again. Amen. Amen. Why don't we give it up to the person that made that decision?